Okay. Well, we've talked a lot about a lot of different things today, but how would you all actually like to go back to school and sit in a common core classroom? No. Well, we're going to do that anyway. Yes. Now, just imagine that you're back in high school and you're a young fella trying to learn empathy so you could learn to interpret the eyes of a woman like that. If you're a young woman, I don't know if you'd be trying to make eyes like that, but um, at any rate, there you are, and you're studying literature. So let's look at the Common Core version of uh, a literature class. And this is from an actual textbook, Prentice Hall's The British Tradition, Volume 2. It bears the logo of the Common Core and has the words Common Core Edition written on the front cover. Now, judging by the table of contents, 17 pages of this textbook are supposedly devoted to Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Now, let's see how Prentice Hall makes use of them. The first two pages are taken up by modern author Elizabeth McCracken, McCracken telling us about a scary nightmare she had as a child, inspired from watching movies such as Frankenstein, Bride of Frankenstein, and Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein. <clears throat> She spends most of these two pages dilating upon this dream. She also writes about her reading, quote, awful books, ghost stories, then true crime books about murderers, cannibals, disasters at sea, and so forth. She does not go on to tell us that she later read Mary Shelley's novel and then it left all those other writings in the dust, or that Frankenstein, being true literature, did more than frighten. It actually captured an important aspect of the human condition. In fact, contemporary author Elizabeth McCracken does not tell us anything about Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. It is not even clear that she has read it. The critical reading box, critical reading box that appear that bears the image of the Common Core asks probing questions such as, what types of frightening movies and books did McCracken enjoy as a child? But that is not all. A silly image taken presumably from a horror movie circa 1955 is accompanied by a question under the heading critical viewing. The question is, which details in this image of Frankenstein's monster convey terror? On the following page, this is the third page so far of this wind up to Mary Shelley, students are informed of different literary terms such as gothic and romantic. They are likewise introduced to the, quote, reading strategy of making predictions. Let us apply this reading strategy to the Common Core edition of the British Tradition, Volume 2. I predict, based on the three pages we have seen so far, that Pearson Prentice Hall will squander a grand opportunity of having students read one of the most important and remembered philosophical novels of the 19th century. We'll see if that, that happens. The next page introduces Mary Shelley. Now this seems reasonable to me. There is even a nice portrait of her as a young woman. The haunting blue background, because they're really playing up the gothic th theme I could do without. On the next page, we are presented with another warm-up to Shelley's text, mostly a photograph of a small castle situated near the Alps and a modicum of information about the myth of Prometheus. Finally, we reach the objective of Mary Shelley's actual words on the sixth page of our selection. But these words turn out to be not Frankenstein or even a short selection from Frankenstein. Rather, they are an introduction Shelley wrote about writing Frankenstein. Okay, so does this introduction serve as some kind of inspiration to go off and read the real novel? Apparently not. There is no invitation to read the book in the student's edition. No study questions are provided that might guide our reading of that story. Only on page 763 of the teacher's edition is there the barest hint that some of the students ought to read some of the book. And I quote, Enrichment for advanced readers. Have interested students read a segment of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, then ask them to prepare book reviews comparing the Frankenstein monster to Shelley's description in her introduction to the work. Ask them to discuss how the book compares with similar novels they have read. What we learn from this prompt is that the central focus of this literature book is not the reading of Frankenstein. Teachers may or may not ask interested students, and how many will those be, two, four, six? To read a segment of the book, presumably a brief one only describing the monster, that will lead to two silly compare and contrast assignments, one involving similar novels they have read, but have they read any? They haven't read Frankenstein yet. <laughs> and what about, this, what about the students who are not advanced readers? 
wouldn't they be able to read and enjoy Frankenstein? Apparently not. And why should even the advanced readers read only a few pages out of this classic? What should students be doing, what would students be doing if they're not reading Frankenstein? Well, according to the notes in the margins of the teacher's edition, they should begin by offering to the class, this is in a class discussion, quote, classic examples of urban myths, tales of alien abductions, or ghost stories. I continue with the quote, quote, examples include stories of alligators in the sewers, a man abducted for his kidneys, and aliens landing in Roswell, New Mexico. <laughs> End quote. Classic examples? The word classic you see is being used very loosely here. To reinforce the findings of this, quote, brainstorming activity, students should also, quote, write a paragraph based on one of these modern urban myths. The class will also discuss Mary Shelley's introduction in various ways. Helping out, Elizabeth McCracken offers several further scholars' insights, including one informing us of another ghost story about a man who buried his murder victim at the base of a tree only to find out that the next year's apples all had a clot of blood at the center of them. Gross. <laughs> On the following page, we learn that Elizabeth McCracken did read the book, which she found better than the movie because in the book, the monster can actually talk. Teachers are prompted to ask students why they think the film version would choose to keep the monster silent. Since the class will not be diverted enough with all this talk of movies, the teacher's edition also recommends that talented and gifted students illustrate one aspect of Shelley's imaginings that is especially gothic in mood and display their gothic art to the rest of the class. Once again, the non-gifted and non-talented students don't get to take part in much of the fun. Do the editors realize that all this extraneous discussion of monsters and ghosts only serves to preserve the silly Hollywood caricature of Frankenstein? Apparently, this caricature is what they want. On page 766, students are encouraged to, quote, write a brief autobiography of a monster. Okay, think that one through. So this, this British scholar was talking about having empathy with human beings. That is not enough. We must have empathy with monsters. In fact, in fact that's a great exercise in multiculturalism. Those poor, misunderstood monsters. <laughs> Students are being asked to write a monster story. What good can come from this? A mere three and a half pages of Mary Shelley's introduction into a mere three and a half pages of Mary Shelley's introduction, the book offers a series of questions under various headings, critical reading, literary analysis, and so forth. Some of these questions are interesting, others are not. The questions offer this facade of learning without genuine learning having taken place. And that's for a very simple reason. My wife, a former English teacher who knows pretense when she sees it, took one look at these pages and put it very simply. The editors are requiring students to have opinions of something they know nothing about. Who needs to read and learn from Frankenstein, or any book from that matter, when a person can just spout off in pseudo-intellectual jargon and never be called to account because no one else has read the book? The production of such opinions in uninformed young people leads to hubris and intellectual dishonesty. Perhaps such practices are simply so sloppy education at work. Yet there's another possibility. What if unfounded opinions in young people are in fact what the authors of the Common Core are after? Keep that question in mind when we get to the Common Core's treatment of the Constitution. The section allegedly devoted to Frankenstein does not end there. The editors of The British Tradition, Volume 2, bring you live from New York, it's Saturday night. <laughs> That's right. Under the heading of Contemporary Connection, this literature textbook apportions five pages, more pages than were given to Mary Shelley, to a script of a Saturday Night Live parody on Frankenstein, and information on the show itself. Students are asked, quote, to share their impressions of the long-running comedy show. Possible response. Students may report amazement that the lively comedy show has been on the air for more than 33 years, and they may mention its many talented comedy artists or talk about sketches that they found most memorable. Uh, you know, in my day, we didn't have to be told by our English teachers or the Common Core to watch Saturday Night Live. We just, we just <laughs> did it. 
again, the talents of the talented and gifted students are called to the fore. They are enlisted to take roles and do a dramatic reading of the SNL Curse of Frankenstein transcript printed in this book. Encourage them to rehearse in small groups, obtain simple props, makeup, or costumes, and present their interpretive reading to the class. Although only the talented, gifted kids will get to act it out, the class as a whole will read and interpret this skit, accompanied by the teacher's insight, handily provided in the margins of the, margins of the teacher's edition. So I'll read from this skit. Villager number one to head villager. Well, maybe you're the monster. Head villager shakes his head. I'm not the monster. Points to Frankenstein's monster. Look at him. He's got a square head and green skin. Frankenstein's monster. Oh, great. Now it's a racial thing. You know what? You guys are a bunch of fascists. Villager, with a lit torch, again steps too close to Frankenstein's monster. Seriously, dude, get that fire away from me. Instructions in the margin of the teacher's edition. Point out the use of the term fascist. Explain its traditional political meaning and how it has been extended to refer to any right-wing extremist group. <laughs> has been extended. You know, the passive voice is a curious thing. Who has done the work of extending the meaning of fascist to any right-wing extremist group? Do the editors of the British tradition approve of that extending? And what constitutes, quote, any right-wing extremist group? The editors of the Common Core version of the British tradition encourage readers to make predictions. I predicted that the editors would waste an opportunity for reading Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. As it turned out, those editors encouraged teachers to have students talk about monsters and perhaps their dreams about monsters, to draw pictures of monsters, to write an autobiography of a monster, to dress up as monsters, to talk about Saturday, Saturday Night Live, and to share their favorite skits from that program, and to act out a Saturday Night Live script. According to the time and resource manager provided next to the Common Core logo in the teacher's edition, these various discussions, activities, or whatever you want to call them would take four days. I know that the things described would easily exhaust a week or maybe more. At no point during that week would the students have read and discussed the actual book called Frankenstein. Instead, they would have spent an entire week in 17 pages, only three and a half devoted to Shelley's words, fumbling around and about Frankenstein. Any college professor who would later want to have a discussion about this novel with these students would be perplexed at why they did not know anything about it. They would not be able to answer the simplest questions, such as where did the story take place, or what led Dr. Frankenstein to create a living being, or was the monster bad from its birth, if you want to call it that? Did he, it, the monster, kill anyone? If so, who and why? So on and so forth. Of course, the bigger questions, such as do we learn anything about education from this novel, or is this story meant to tell us anything about God, are off the table. Any guess as to the grade level at which all this critical thinking would take place? A senior in high school. A second semester senior in high school. Now, I've taken a fair amount of time today to walk you through an actual example of a series of Common Core inspired lessons because what I think we learn from it is that all this talk of college and career readiness, as limited as those aims are, as, as the Common Core means them to be, nonetheless, it doesn't even do that. This is not preparing anyone for college. How in the world could this sort of thing compare a student for college? It's no accident that I get college freshmen in my classes every year who truly Though they're smart and bright and nice people, they cannot have a discussion about a single work of literature. So if you're looking for state standards, I have a really easy one. Read Frankenstein. <laughs> buy the actual book. Buy the novel. The language is beautiful. It's, it's a deep story. And the other state standard is to take these textbooks, which are fakes, they're fake learning, and throw them out the window. Everything about the Common Core, and I, and I could go into each part of the Common Core, the standards, the introduction, Appendix A, 
all that sort of stuff. I really think that a lot of that is simply window dressing to try for this agency, this common core group, whatever it wants to call itself, achieve or what have you, to get into the classrooms and to program students into thinking certain things about their own political tradition, about the way to read literature, and all the rest of it. And I've been working on this. I've, I've been working on this actually all summer because I was very, I was actually quite inspired uh, when I saw Mrs. Tuttle give a, give a speech uh, up in Fort Wayne. And so I've spent almost the whole summer on this and I have just found the most incredible things about uh, the Common Core. And if you actually read Appendix B, which is the text that are supposed to be read, and then you compare that to the things that actually go on in the textbooks, you will see a trend taking place. A trend that involves superficiality at the, at the very highest levels, if you can have a high level of superficiality as I've just demonstrated. They demonstrate political bias, they demonstrate anti-religious bias in a major way. And if I were to spend some time with what they do, for example, with the um, sinners in the hands of an angry God, you, you cannot believe how they program children to read that text. And then on top of that, their other big thing that they're bringing in that they don't want to talk about is also the whip of multiculturalism. And maybe we'll talk about that a little bit in the discussion. But I've given you just one example here. I could give you 20 different examples. And in fact, I'm, I'm about to do that because I think I'm about to release a book on this subject. And it is astonishing the irresponsibility that is actually in the way that these documents are read. I, I want to I just give you two more examples because I, I don't want to take up uh, too much more of your time. But one of the examples that I like to bring in is uh, from Pride and Prejudice, which is one of, my, one of my favorite novels. It's one of the novels that truly is still read by people. And a lot of young people read it on their own. Uh, I think probably 40 or 50 percent of the young women that I've met have read it. And if they haven't done that, they've at least seen the movie. So it's still a book that's very much living in our culture. And I could take you through Appendix B and how it a asks us to analyze um, the, um, a actually how it tells you through what they call a sample performance test to analyze Pride and Prejudice. And all I can say is it's just the cockamamiest way of ever looking at that book that I could think of. And it, and it has to do with a lot of ways that literature is studied in the schools, which is simply ineffective. And it's not the way literature is currently studied in schools designed to do what the professor was telling you, which is to understand the human condition and how to relate to people. That's not what they're trying to get you to do in those texts. But I'm not going to take you through that to that um, this day, because all you have to do is to go into this textbook and realize in Appendix B, Pride and Prejudice has held up one of these as one of these exemplar texts. And so if you're just thumbing through Appendix B, and you're an education reformer, and you see all these texts that are, that are, that are good texts, you say, OK, well, this is OK. You know, why, are, why are so many conservatives upset? These are good texts that they put in here. Well, first of all, they're not going to be read in the right way, as I would suggest. But secondly, if you actually go to the literature textbook, you find that it is a recommended reading for private reading. And it has the mark next to it, exemplar text, but the students are not going to be reading Pride and Prejudice, I assure you, in, in, call, in high school classes. It's there is window dressing to make us think that they're going to be right, reading Pride and Prejudice, but if they do anything, they'll just get a little sample of Jane Austen and what her world is, and they'll probably cook up some, some ideas about how class is an important aspect of, of Pride and Prejudice, so on and so forth. That's actually what they're after. So don't think just because you see in Appendix B a bunch of books that look like they're really great that they're going to be read in the right way. On, on Appendix B as well, I'd like to say something just briefly about the way that they're teaching the U.S. Constitution, because we started off this entire program by talking about federalism and the U.S. Constitution and all those things. Understand that for a uh, republic, a self-governing republic, to have that discussion, people actually have to know what the rule of law is, and they have to know what their country's law is. <coughs> If they don't read that, if they don't get that, uh, that training and that education, then you can't have a discussion with people about federalism. So what do we find in the presentation of the U.S. Constitution in the Common Core itself? And now I'm looking at the core documents exclusively. In the middle school age ban, the students are required to read the First Amendment and uh, also, the, um, also the preamble. They're not required to read the Second Amendment, of course not, or the Third Amendment, or the Tenth Amendment, which is not in there. <laughs> Apparently, the young critical thinkers we are told the Common Core will be making are not ready for the Constitution by the eighth grade. 
even though the core knowledge sequence, which is a well-known K-8 curriculum used by a lot of charter schools and a few district public schools, has students read the entire U.S. Constitution in the eighth grade. More surprisingly, students are not required to read the whole Constitution in the 11th or the 12th grades, only the Bill of Rights. Now, we could be charitable and say that the students will be reading the Constitution in government or history. If so, then why are we given the Bill of Rights in English and a book on the Constitution in the History Social Studies section of the Appendix B, but not the Constitution itself? Well, the brief selection taken from that book is more alarming. And this is a, a modern book that was written. The selection does not explain federalism, checks and balances, or the separation of powers, the rule of law, or the authority of we the people, things that we would expect to find in an introduction to the Constitution. Rather, the selection, having been so heavily edited that it does not even make complete sense, is riddled with incendiary language, such as vicious, master class, and ugly. What I derive from this is that we cannot count on students to read the whole Constitution themselves. We cannot introduce a complex informational text, such as Madison's classic Federalist number, Numbers 10 or 51. But we can use incendiary language pulled from a recently written book to create in our students a distaste for the Constitution they haven't read. If that's not programming, I don't know what it is. And if you don't believe me, turn to page 176 of Appendix B in the Common Core English Standards. Thank you. <laughs>